Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me on a Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is Lawrence Yousefian, as you see on the slide. Uh, I am a barrister at Goldsmith Chambers. I specialize in immigration, asylum, and UK nationality law. Um, I am told that there are about 109 of you here uh, on a very niche topic about indefinitely to remain and the Court of Appeal case of Ahmed, that there are so many of you here should uh, make me extremely happy, but I am saddened that my audience is of nerds, which is a good thing, I'm sure. Um, few housekeeping things. Uh, so there will be a Q&A at the end. Um, I will be taking a couple of questions, so feel free to type in if you have any questions um, in the Q&A. Um, and if you have, I'm, I'm happy to send my uh, slides to you personally by email. So if you would want this, please put in your email address um, in the chats and I will be sending you the slides. And at the end, there's also a feedback poll that you can provide to tell me whether you liked or enjoyed this webinar or not. Um, I'm just going to double check that everybody can hear me. Brilliant. I'm getting things on chat. Fantastic. Okay. So indefinitely to remain on long residence grounds. Uh, this is under paragraph 276B. Um, and really it's going to be a brief overview. Um, so paragraph 276B of the rules, you should be fairly familiar if you're practicing immigration law with this. this uh, this paragraph governs the requirements for indefinite leave to remain. And here we're really primarily concerned with um, paragraph 276B1A, the continuous lawful residence requirement, and finally the last one, applicant must not be in the UK in breach of immigration laws. And we're going to be looking at the interplay between the two paragraphs, subparagraphs rather, and uh, we're going to see very briefly examine the Court of Appeal case of Ahmed. So um, what we used to understand from the subparagraph five of 276B of the rules is that there was, a, there was in essence a consensus both in law and in practice that 276B5 related to both uh, current applications for indefinitely to remain so that when you are, if you are in the UK unlawfully at the time of the application, then it will be refused under 276B5. But it also had the effect, because it referred to, uh, as you can see the highlighter is, because it referred to previous period of overstaying, the understanding was that if you had overstayed your visa, if there was a period of overstay, um, before the application would definitely leave to remain, then if these circumstances applied, then those periods would essentially be cured so that you wouldn't fall foul of the first requirement of the indefinitely leave to remain, which is continuous lawful residence. That was everybody's understanding. Uh, however, the case of Ahmed in the Court of Appeal, which was given on 21st of June 2019, essentially held otherwise. There was another case in the upper tribunal, which, called, which is called also Ahmed, Ahmed uh, but we're not particularly concerned with that at the moment. Um, I'm going to focus on this Court of Appeal case because this is so far the authority on it. Now, uh, this is an appeal against a decision of upper tribunal judge who had refused permission to bring judicial review proceedings. It's important to remember that in the case of Ahmed, this wasn't a gap in the middle of lawful residence, but this was the gap at the end, meaning um, an application was submitted after somebody's lawful resident, after the client's lawful residence had come to an end, but within 14 days, the application for indefinitely to remain had been made. Now there's an appeal to the Court of Appeal. Permission was refused and it was an appeal to the Court of Appeal. It's a permission decision and it's not a substantive Court of Appeal decision, uh, but it was nevertheless promulgated and we'll look at that now. So the Court of Appeal essentially uh, held against applicant and appellant and said, that contrary to what everybody else thought previously, that paragraph 276B was separate freestanding provisions. 
and there was no cross-referencing between subparagraph 5 and subparagraph 1a. And they were, they were all self-contained in their meaning. That means that essentially the Court of Appeal held that it doesn't convert the previous periods of unlawful residence, even if there is a gap, that doesn't then convert it into lawful residence so far as paragraph 276b1a is concerned. It didn't cross refer to each other. And then the Court of Appeal refers to um, um, paragraph 276a. And it says, again, no corresponding provision which allows residence which is not continuously lawful to be deemed unbroken. It is here that one would expect to find saying that the applicant incorrectly contends created by paragraph 276b5, and one does not. And so the Court of Appeal finds that um, as a result, there are two separate uh, provisions. One refers to, one requirement is for you to properly, without any single period, of being an overstayer for a 10 years continuous period. That's the first requirement. And the fifth, uh, pa that's paragraph under subparagraph one. And under subparagraph five, the question is, you cannot be unlawfully in the UK. Now, at paragraph 15, subparagraph eight of the Court of Appeal judgment, the court also says that reliance on home office guidance didn't assist the appellant in that case to construe the requirements of the rules. Now, after the case of Ahmed, there was a bit of noise within the immigration practitioners uh, to understand how this would be affected. There are, it's worth to note that there are two further cases in the Court of Sessions Outer House which considered Ahmed, and uh, you will perhaps know that the Court of Sessions is not bound by the Court of Appeal case of Ahmed, but they nevertheless agreed with it and followed it. Um, the, the earliest, the latest rather, one is the 11th of March 2020 uh, decision. Now, I should say at this stage um, that in it, purely legalistic, from a legalistic point of view, I do agree with the Court of Appeals decision because those five paragraphs are not interrelated. They are separate freestanding self-contained uh, provisions. What's unfortunate is that the Secretary of State in drafting the, the rules, poorly drafted those rules. And so the poorly drafted ru rules were, um, I suppose in one way they were trying to cure it through the guidance, but the rules as they stand, I believe the Court of Appeal is correct, their interpretation. So what do we do? We have, I hope you appreciate that um, transition. I put a lot of time into that. Let me just do it again. Um, <laughs> so what do we do? We rely on home office guidance. That's what we have to do. Now, how do we go about it? First of all, you might say, hold on, Lawrence, didn't the Court of Appeal consider the Home Office guidance? And it's true. The Court did, and I've already referred to this, the Court of Appeal did consider the Home Office guidance, but the context in which the Court considered the guidance was to construe the intentions and construe the meaning of the rules. And we know from the case of Mahad and Pokiar, for instance, we cannot use Secretary of State's guidance, home office guidance, to construe the intention of the rules. That's the context in which uh, the guidance was considered. So what does the home office guidance say? The home office guidance on long residence, version 16.0. It's important to remember that this version, 16.0, 16 was published on 28th of October 2019. The Ahmed case was uh, the Ahmed case in the Court of Appeal was given in June 2019. So this long residence guidance comes after the Court of Appeal case of Ahmed. And that's significant because you will see from the guidance that it still continues to accept that breaks in lawful residence doesn't mean that the application for indefinite leave to remain should be refused. That is completely contrary what, to what 
the Court of Appeal in Ahmed has stated. It accepts that short gaps, and it's important that it uses the word gaps, but short gaps in lawful residence prior to 24th of November 2016 um, will, be, uh, will not break the continuous lawful residence if the application is made within 28 days of leave expiring. And if it's after 24th of November 2016, then um, that also that short gap will also not be held against the applicant if leave was granted pursuant to Part 39 of the Immigration Rules. Just one thing, it says here, when you look at the guidance, you will see at page 16, it says here, time spent outside the UK, which is fairly confusing, but this, I'm convinced, is a typographical error. Uh, and I, that's why I've put here, ignore this, uh, because um, when you look at the guidance, you'll see further down the line, they, uh, once again, the next page, they say time spent outside the UK, which actually addresses the question about time spent outside the UK. So you can, if, if you're relying on the guidance, you can ignore this, don't be confused by this. Right. It also says, you can see from the examples at page 17 of the guidance, it continues to say applicant has a single, if an applicant has a single gap in their lawful residence, you submit an application 17 days out of time, all other applications thereafter being submitted out uh, in time throughout the 10 year period, you would grant it because application uh, allows for a period of overstaying of 28 days. And so as a result, we can say that that um, the guidance is more generous than the immigration rules. Contrary to what Ahmed has held, the rules, uh, sorry, um, the guidance allows an applicant to rely on short gaps or gaps in the lawful residence to satisfy the indefinite leave to remain requirement. Now, how do we go about relying on this home office guidance? Because it's important at this stage, if, if your client has any period of overstaying, let's say leave expired uh, and then within, let's say the appeal was dismissed and then within uh, five days, a fresh application is made and then that application is approved and then later on you come to apply for indefinite leave to remain. Uh, on the base of case of court of appeal case of Ahmed, the application technically doesn't satisfy the requirement of the rules because you don't satisfy 10 years continuous lawful residence because there's a period where you weren't lawfully in the UK. So what you do is you have to rely on the home office guidance because the rules are no longer going to assist you or your client. So the first step is to acknowledge the Court of Appeal decision in your application, in your legal submissions, in your skeleton argument, in your argument in court, in your oral advocacy, whatever you're doing, you should make sure to acknowledge the Court of Appeal case of Ahmed. There's no utility in not doing it. Um, everybody's aware of it. And you're also professionally obliged to bring it to the court, court's attention. So I am of the view that it makes uh, your case more persuasive if you tackle Ahmed head on and essentially put your hands up and say, we, we accept what Ahmed says, but we're not relying on Ahmed. What we're doing is we're relying on the Secretary of State's guidance. And we know that um, the Secretary of State's guidance, although it can't be restrictive, more restrictive than the rules, it can certainly be more generous than the rules. So there's no conflict in us saying that the Secretary of State's guidance is more um, generous and therefore the tribunal or the Secretary of State herself should uh, apply her guidance. We also know that Secretary of State, the Home Office, Secretary of State is required by law to follow her, follow her own published policy unless there are good reasons not doing so. Uh, I doubt there are any particular good reasons as a general point that uh, would allow the Secretary of State to not follow her published policy, especially given that this guidance was published after um, the case of Ahmed. In the case of Ahmed, in the Court of Appeal case of Ahmed, it was the, the Court of Appeal specifically uh, stated that the Secretary of State may wish to reconsider her policy so that this is a previous version of the policy, version 15, previous version of the policy so that it is more in keeping with the rules. That was specifically uh, stated in the, in the Court of Appeal judgment. And yet five months after Ahmed, 
what the Secretary of State did in updating the guidance still states what it does and it's still more generous than the rules. And so we would persuasively, hopefully, argue that the Secretary of State's guidance should be considered by the Tribunal or Secretary of State. Now, therefore, given, given the Home Office guidance, now, no, now that we're not really concerned with the immigration rules anymore, we essentially have to rely on the guidance. In my view, there isn't really any longer room to argue that an, app, an ILR application made within 14 days of leave expiring, that period awaiting a decision on that ILR application can be considered as period continuing counting towards lawful residence. We have had many cases, much like in Ahmed, where somebody accrues, let's say, nine years of continuous lawful residence, and then their appeal ends at nine years, five months. And then within 28 days prior to November, 24th of November 2016, or within 14 days under paragraph 39E, you might make an indefinite leave to remain application, hoping that while the application is pending, your client or yourself will cross the threshold of 10 years since you've entered the UK. This argument has been running several uh, for, well, as long as I know. And following the case of Ahmed, I'm afraid we're no longer, I'm at least of the view, that we're no longer able to argue uh, that that period should be disregarded, waiting for a decision so that you accrue continuous lawful residence. And that's quite a blow, to be honest. Um, but there is a potential argument that we could raise, and it applies only to an extremely narrow set of facts. And I've tried to uh, come up with them. I actually had a case on this, and I'm just waiting a decision for this case. Um, it's, um, I'm just being told that I'm halfway through. Right. Um, so extremely narrow set of facts. Um, it's important to uh, caveat this by saying that I know that I'm clutching at straws here, but um, just bear with me. So what are those facts? First of all, if uh, within 28 days of leave expiring, a leave to remain application was made before 24th of November 2016, so let's say you're at nine years, you've reached nine years, and it's, this is before November, 24th of November 2016, and you apply for limited leave to remain. And then that limited leave to remain doesn't get decided in time. And so whilst it's outstanding, you vary it to an indefinite leave to remain application on long residence grounds. And it has, it's important, the variation application was made after 24th of November 2016. So very narrow set of facts. I, I doubt many cases fall within this, but if there is a case that falls within this, then potentially we can argue by relying only on the Home Office guidance that the latter period, the end period, could still, should rather, be disregarded such that it counts towards continuous lawful residence. Um, I have one case like this, as I said, we're waiting for a decision on it. So how do we argue that? So the issue of state's guidance, this is, um, still the long residence guidance on out of, it, out of time applications. This is in relation to the 10 years ILR application, okay? Applications made before 24th of November, 2016 says where the application was made before 24th of November, 2016, a period of overstaying of 20 day, eight days or less on the date of the application will be disregarded. That's what the Home Office guidance says on long residence. But you will say, hold on, in the scenario I just gave you, the indefinite leave to remain application was made after 24th November 2016. This is a variation application. Correct. But what do we know about variation applications? This is the home of his guidance of application for leave to remain, validation, variation, and withdrawal, version 2.0, 30th November 2018. At page 18, it says, date of application for um, a variation application. Where an application is vary, varied, the application date remains the date of the original application. So, tying those two together, it means even though you've made your indefinite leave to remain a variation application after 24th of November 2016, because it's a variation application, technically it is still considered, pursuant to the Secretary of State's own guidance, it is still considered to have been an ILR application made before 24th of November 2016. 
And given that it would have been applied, you would have applied 28 days or less, within 28 days or less of the date of application of leave expiring, you can say that the period awaiting that decision should be disregarded. As I say, it's, it's a nuanced argument and uh, we're gonna have to see how that uh, goes. And it only applies a really narrow set of facts, I'm afraid. And outside of these uh, facts, I am of the view that you can no longer sort of bolt on an additional period of uh, residence after making application pursuant to paragraph 30, uh, 39E. So, What does that mean? Where does that leave us? Even if you can't satisfy the indefinite leave to remain requirements, okay, don't then not rely on the length of residence in the UK. Even if you've only accrued nine, year, nine and a half years, that's still very relevant in the proportionality assessment. After all, the appeal is concerned with Article 8 and private life and family life. Now, I've said here to uh, highlight in the client's mindset during those 10 years, but in particular, uh, if the client was close to satisfying the ILR requirement. And the reason I say this is because I'm drawing a parallel with the case of Aguiar Code, paragraph 53. It says, one can, for example, envisage circumstances in which people might be under a reasonable misapprehension as to their ability to maintain family life in the UK, and in which a less stringent approach might therefore be appropriate. This is in relation to the little weight provision um, under section 117b5, which says that little weight should be given to a private life established at a time when a person's uh, immigration status is precarious or sorry, this, in relation to family life rather, this is. Um, and I appreciate that this is about family life, but one can potentially draw a parallel and say, if the client's mindset, as he was inching, he or she was inching closer to the tenure requirement, was under a reasonable misapprehension that their life in the UK was going to take a more permanent form, then potentially the tribunal would be entitled to attach more than little weight under section 117b5 of the uh, 2002 act to that person's private life and length of residence. So it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we can still rely on the length of residence, uh, notwithstanding the case of Ahmed, please rely on the Secretary of State's guidance because this is extremely helpful still um, and continue to um, highlight the importance of the length of residence of your client's length of residence uh, and don't shy away from drafting very detailed uh, witness statements to explain your client's mindset as he or she was inching closer to the indefinitely to remain requirement. Um, I, I've had very short time to present this so hopefully um, you were able to follow um, that concludes my uh, seminar on this. Just to let you know, um, I think, let me see, I think there are some Q and A's. I'm gonna take some Q and A's now. If you'd like to type out your questions, please do so and I'll answer a couple live here. Um, just to let you know, this uh, webinar is recorded so you can see this later on our YouTube channel and on our website. As I've said, if you want my slides, please send me your email via the chat and I will make sure to send you my slides. So thank you for listening. Uh, let's see. A lot of, a lot of Q and A's are asking me to send them the slides, which I will. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm just, how does guidance rely on this argument? Right, so uh, one question I have, and this is a quick, good question, is, is how does the guidance and relying on this to argue against Ahmed assist if only ground of appeal is a human rights one? Uh, this is a very good question um, because it's a, it's a valid point. Now, what I would say to that is 
the tribunal is concerned with proportionality. That's what the tribunal is ultimately concerned with. And as we know, if an appellant, we know from the case of TZ, for instance, if an appellant satisfies the requirements of the rules, then that emphatically means, and it's dispositive of the question of proportionality, because how could it be proportionate to remove somebody from the UK if they satisfy the requirements of the rules? Equally, if the Secretary of State follows, uh, fails to follow her published policy, then that is arguably a public law error, and that necessarily impinges on the proportionality exercise under Article 8. So you, if you can show the judge that this is what the guidance says, and this is how, it should follow, how the Secretary of State should make her decisions, and if the judge agrees with you, then that would, in my view, definitely make, a dif uh, make an impact on proportionality assessment. So it is still relevant. You would still raise human rights and you'd still advance uh, arguments on human rights by reference to the Secretary of State's guidance. Um, let me see if there are any other questions. I think that's all it. I'm, I'm still receiving emails, um, email addresses rather, uh, which I will later on send my slides to. Thank you very much for, for providing. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I hope you found this webinar uh, interesting. We still have a lot of different webinars going, going on from the family team, the civil team, and the immigration team. So please check on our website for any other webinars you might like to join. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. You have my email address here and my clerk, clerk, clerk's details here. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye then.